Tonight I will briefly be speaking to you about the role of the media, the role that the media plays in our society, looking specifically at the unprecedented effects of the internet and the responsibilities of journalists. Now firstly, I'd like to begin by clarifying the term media, as the word can take on various meanings. I am referring to the main means of mass communication regarding broadcasting, publishing and the internet. Therefore, <coughs> I will be mainly talking about the media in regards to a source of information and communication. Now, the media is an incredibly powerful tool and has the potential to sculpt our social and political beliefs. And we can see through history how the media has often been used as a weapon to evoke political change. Propaganda like this has been found as far, dating as far back as 1515 BC, with primitive cartoons showing the rise of the Persian king Darius the Great to the throne. In a more modern context, we can see how the rousing and patriotic propaganda such as this um, helped Britain and the United Nations win both the First and Second World War, with this particular example created during World War I. Thus, it is only inevitable that the combination of the huge influence of the media and the profound change, the profound change inventions such as the mass printing press and the internet have on our society this means that our society today is hugely shaped by the media of yesterday. Let me take you back to 1900, where the media and journalism was restricted to four main platforms. This is advertising, radio, newspapers, and for the privileged few, cinemas. The media landscape was slow, limited, and fairly inaccessible, with 78% global illiteracy imp impending, impeding much global journalism and understanding. <coughs> However, the invention of the internet in 1983 completely transformed our conception of the media and changed how journalism and broadcasting operated profusely. And the more, addition, the more recent addition to the media landscape is social media, which now plays a major, major role in the media industry. I'd like to show of hands those of you who think they use social media on a daily basis. Pretty much most of us. Now, the statistic website, Statista, said that in two years' time, a third of us will be social media users. This figure trumps the estimate that almost a seventh of us, a seventh, a seventh of us rely on the radio as our primary news source, and only a quarter of us now use formal newspapers. Hence, this is why I am focusing on the internet so specifically, and due to the sheer leverage and gravity the platform has on us today. There are many pros the rise of social media has had in broadcasting and journalism. For example, journalists now have increased access to content and information, making news coverage more comprehensive and thorough. As a society, we arguably have more knowledge and informity than ever to information, and supposedly we are more aware of the world around us. Lastly, social media has somewhat informalised broadcasting, allowing more creativity and ingenuity in the industry ultimately making content more digestible and appealing. However, there are many points of concern regarding the effects social media is having on our lives, where it can be seen to be both evasive on our personal lives and also perhaps more concerning on the political climate. I'm sure most of you probably recognise and possibly use the majority of these sites, um, and which you trust and give your personal data to. <coughs> now, I'm also sure most of you aren't aware of sites like this one, this one, or this one, who also have access to such information. These companies are called data harvesters and are often described as profit-making propaganda machines. Effectively, a data harvesting company is fairly self-explanatory, a concept, a concept where firms like these buy information from companies like these, um, and this is analysed so that your shopping, travel, or even political habits can be targeted and often altered by specifically designed information. <coughs> Take the Cambridge Analytica scandal in March 2018, where an ex-employee called out the data harvesting firm for its links to the 2016-17 US presidential campaign. The company was investigated and found liable to a $71 billion plus lawsuit after it purchased information from Facebook and used this to create specifically designed content which would encourage US, US users to vote for the Trump campaign. You may ask how this occurred, and why it is so ethically and legally despicable. And this is mainly as the methods the companies are using are worryingly subtle and simple. For instance, quizzes that I'm sure many of you have participated in, such as what type of sandwich or what type of dog are you, and even the stranger and more curious amongst you may have even taken part in a 
what piece of IKEA furniture are you? Which I did do, and interestingly, I am this floor lamp. <laughs> I mean, I dispute the resemblance personally. <laughs> All jokes aside, your response to questions like these allow companies to build up a psychological profile of you, in turn allowing them to make assumptions on your political leanings. This is a useful service to some, specifically for shopping, where Amazon recommends will interest you into buying items due to complex algorithms. Seemingly trivial, however, when such messages begin to influence one polit one's political habits, the practice turns utterly immoral and threatens democracy itself. Now, I'm not suggesting such software could turn socialists into capitalists or convince a Democrat to vote for Trump. However, it is still important to consider the possibility this content may have led to a weaker voting turnout or just changing social habits. I want you to recognise how inconspicuously these companies can access your data with political campaigns or marketing, with where politi which two political campaigns or marketing firms can be gold dust. Many economists are now saying that data has replaced oil in regards to being the most valuable resource we have. And although I personally disagree with this notion in many respects, I do believe it holds a degree of gravity and significance. Clearly, there are other companies out there like Analytica, which was eventually forced to shut down in May 2018, that harvest your data. And I question if such an increasing trend breaches our fundamental human rights. I'd like you all to think <coughs> what you believe your most rudimentary and important human rights are. Possibly freedom of speech possibly your educational rights, or maybe even for some, your right to keep your phones after lights out, which I'm sure you feel very deprived from. <laughs> Personally, I value my right to protect my own information duty. Unfortunately, laws in place in the UK, such as the 2018 Data Protection Act, ensure personal information given to companies must be used fairly, lawfully, and transparently, and that one's race, religion, or sexual orientation cannot be used. Although laws like this exist, I do still prompt us all to be wary and vigilant when sharing information online, as highlighted through the example of Cambridge Analytica. On the same topic of human rights, I'd like a show of hands to all of those who believe that it is your fundamental human right to have access to all publicly shared or published information, news and journalism. Most of you, and unsurprisingly, like you, after the <coughs> survey was conducted by the Internet Society in 2012, Using 10,000 internet users from a range of 20 different countries, 83% responded believing that they have the right to access all public information out there. Why is it then that leaders such as, leaders such as Kim Jong-un or Xi Jinping still put strict limits and parameters on the media, only allowing specific governmental approved information to circulate? The answer is fairly simple and understandable. To prevent the spread of unsavory or revolutionary or radical ideas, which arguably aim to protect their citizens rather than oppress them. Surely if governments are able to decide on such fund fundamental and drastic laws, such as the death penalty or your drinking age, they also have the right to control the media and broadcasting. Now, don't worry, I'm not agreeing with these questionable, unethical and perhaps autocratic beliefs, rather prompting you to consider the argument for censorship over freedom of speech. As I am as I am, and I'm sure many of you do also, believe that the media should have complete autonomy and freedom, as this allows a healthy democracy where ideas can spread, which often leads to much needed social and political change. It is therefore a vital characteristic of democracy and freedom to have the power to say what you want, where you want, and to whomever it may concern. And I believe similar standards should be applicable to the media. This leads me on to my last main concern with the media the topic of false news and fake and false fake news and false information. I'm curious whether it should be the responsibility of the media to present the truth or merely journalists to perceive what they think the truth is. The term fake news is a relatively new term, although the concept of fake news in regards to fictitious news stories has been around for millennia. If you think about it, any form of mythology could be could be considered as fake news. To many contemporaries like Trump the concept of fake news is one of the greatest threats to democracy, although it is clear he employs the term as a scapegoat, just to cover up unwanted or unflattering information about himself. Arguably, the internet has been particularly facilitating for fake news, where it may often encourage people to present an augmented or distorted reality of the world. This idea presents the solution of journalistic objectivity, 
which arguably aims to show the audience, which aims to allow the audience to make their own to make their own mind up about a story, providing facts alone and then letting audiences interpret those on their own judgment, which for once presents Trump's opinion as seemingly justified and promoting equality. However, although this sounds like an attractive notion, I believe that suppressing so-called fake news would only lead to complete suppression of the media, leading to a world without the media completely. I believe that we cannot expect the media to present a rose-tinted and factually correct view of the world, where the emission of so-called fake news would lead to an oppressive society with little, with little political change. Now, this asks the question, what would the world look like without media? It would be far more than a world without newspapers, journalists, or news presenters. I believe it would be a world with ignorant and unempathetic people, where politics would become even more distorted and sources of information would be even more unreliable. Although I'm unsure this applies to the Daily Mail. Without a free press, free press and journalistic liberty, we would possibly see an increase in brainwashing and indoctrination like that evident in states such as North Korea, where the government has full control over the media. It seems unjust to give the media this responsibility to present only a truthful world, and seems like a utopian and utterly unattainable goal, where society has become so subjective that we find endless conflicts in regarding what is the truth and what is false. Um, thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.